Hey everyone, welcome back to Eyes on Dry Eyes, streaming live from the exhibit hall here in San Diego, California. Hope you've been having a fantastic show. I know we are, we are thrilled with the results so far. I think we're up to over a quarter million minutes of education watched. Everyone's having a great time, so thank you for attending. Super excited to bring on our next guest. It's Dr. Marion Maxi, Chief Medical Officer at Oyster Point. Let's bring her on. What's going on? Good to see you. Nice to see you, Matt. Thanks for having me. You got it. You enjoying the show so far? It's great. Just great. You're doing a great job. Yeah. No, thank you. It's been, it's been a long road to get here, but I think after that like first half hour, you know, when everything started, everyone's tensions on our team eased and it's been just a, a blessing and having so much fun so far. Great. So, you know, I think Oyster Point has been one of the most exciting companies to watch in the dry eye space and, and certainly has been one that I've been tuning into. Uh, but tell us about what's in the pipeline when it comes to dry eye. Well, thanks, Matt. Let me first introduce everyone to Oyster Point. Sure. Oyster Point is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that's focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of first-in-class pharmaceutical therapies to treat ocular surface diseases. We have a passion for science and an unwavering dedication to revolutionize ocular surface innovation to change the lives of our patients. Our leading investigational product candidate, OCL1 nasal spray, is a highly selective nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist. OCO1 nasal spray is being developed to treat both the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Now, OCO1 has not been approved by the FDA, but they have accepted our NDA, and we are waiting for approval. Love it. That's wonderful to hear. As mentioned, I knew you guys are developing some awesome stuff in the space. Now, um, yes. you know, what fascinates me is always the why behind things, right? And I guess, can you share right. more about that? What is the why? What's the reason for going after OCO1? And um, yeah, tell me more. Well, Matt, I think we both know as practitioners that when we look at the dry eye population, mm -hmm. we see an unmet need. You know, it's estimated there are approximately 34 million adults in the United States living with dry eye disease. And of those, 16 million have been diagnosed. Approximately 7 million patients have tried currently available treatment options, but less than 2 million are currently on some form of treatment. That's a small number. And about 13 million patients have been diagnosed with dry eyes that are willing to try new treatments. So when I look at that as a practitioner, I see an unmet need, as do we at Oyster Point. Yeah, no, for sure. And by the way, everyone, we are uh, monitoring the chat, so do ask questions in the chat. We'll hand them over to Dr. Maxi for sure. So, um, tear film homeostasis seems to be such a key piece of the puzzle here, such a key piece of the equation. Um, and I'd love to hear more about how um, Oyster Point is considering this. Well, Matt, I think we both know that dry eye disease is a chronic multifactorial disease of the ocular surface. Mm -hmm characterized by the loss of tear film homeostasis. Tear film homeostasis involves a balance among the layers of the tear film that provide a stable ocular surface. Only when the tear film is disrupted or unstable through either decreased tear production or increased tear evaporation are the cornea and conjunctiva susceptible to damage, opening the door for potential inflammation. Once the tear film is inflamed, there can be further loss of tear film homeostasis. And this cascade can lead to chronic ocular surface damage, perpetuating that harmful cycle of dry eye disease for our patients. 
But I just want to stress that inflammation is not the cause. It's really the sequelae that we see when we have lost that tear foam homeostasis, Mm -hmm. which is so critical. Yeah, and and it's funny, you know, I think when we think dry, we're thinking so narrow-minded to just the eye, either my Bohmian glands or whatever it might be, but the nervous system is obviously a key role here, and uh, it seems to be something that you guys are, you know, have your sights on big time. Tell me more about this nervous system, uh, you know, uh, and your focus on it. Well, the nervous system in the production of the natural tear film is actually much simpler than people think. Mm -hmm. The parasympathetic nervous system controls tear film homeostasis. So if we think about tear film production, it can be triggered by various stimuli and it's regulated by neural pathways, including the parasympathetic rest and digest, remember back in school, Mm -hmm. and the sympathetic fight or flight systems. So tear film homeostasis is regulated by the trigeminal parasympathetic stimulation of the lacrimal function unit to activate complete natural tear film secretion and maintain tear film homeostasis. So what's the lacrimal function unit? Well, I think you and I both know it's an integrated system of the lacrimal glands the ocular surface, including the cornea, conjunctiva, meibomian glands, as well as the eyelids and the sensory and motor nerves that connect them. So let me give you an example. I want to give you an example of the parasympathetic nervous system controlling tear foam homeostasis. Mm -hmm. 34% of our basal tear production is due to inhaling air through the nose. Hmm. Didn't know that. So let me say that again. Yeah. 34% of our basal tear foam production is due to inhaling air through the nose. Because when the air passes through our nose, it stimulates the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway, which in turn stimulates the lacrimal function unit mm-hmm. to produce normal, healthy tears. So that's why when you have that terrible head cold and your nose is stuffed, you end up spending the whole night mouth breathing, you wake up in the morning with dry, crusted eyes, feeling that sensation that our dry eye patients feel every day. (laughs) That's so funny. I can't, I feel like I can't take a deep breath now without thinking about that process. And I don't know, I mean, maybe it's been a while since optometry school, but I certainly... Uh, we either wasn't taught that or forgot, simply forgot. Well, actually, I'm going to tell you, Dr. Stephen Flugfelder is the one who identified that. Interesting. So it is um, a really interesting fact about the importance of the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway. Yeah, yeah. It's, it actually explains a lot. I feel like you could go so deep into that, and we'll have to save that for later. So so since you're okay. you're, you're getting my education levels back up, even though I, <laughs> I don't have to pay you student loans or anything like that, uh, bring us back to just like no. tear film composition. What is it made of, and how does that play a role in tear film homeostasis? Well, the tear film is super complex. Mm-hmm. And the more time goes by, the more we learn about it. It's not just three layers. We know that. There are five classes of lipids. There are over 1,500 proteins and more than 20 mucins and electrolytes that compose our tear foam. And a healthy tear foam will protect your eye from inflammation and infection. I mean, for example, lactoferrin is a protein in the natural tear foam that has anti-inflammatory properties, just like lysozyme is a protein that has antimicrobial properties. And they're both important in maintaining tear foam homeostasis. We all know that the tear foam also acts to lubricate the eye. It acts as a refractive surface to maintain clear vision and washes away foreign particles. So you can see that tear film is really complex and 
the maintenance of terraform homeostasis is super important. The tear film by nature will maintain its own homeostasis. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about the body. It just seems to have this ability that's to take right. care of itself. But it can go awry at times, right? And that's why uh, yep. That's why us dry eye docs are here. But, um, you know, Oyster Point's got a, your leading pipeline candidate is OCO1. I know that there's so much to learn about this and there's folks that are, are just, I can, I can see the groundswell starting to build where, where there is some curiosity more so than not being generated. But for those out there that are unaware, please tell us about it. Okay. Well, now you're talking about what I love to talk about. <laughs> so OCO1 um, is a preservative free nasal spray. Um, so it has a unique, route of administration for dry eyes as a nasal spray. The active ingredient is varenicline, also seen in smoking cessation medication, but in a much lower concentration. So OCO1 is a highly selective nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist that we've developed to treat the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. The mechanism of action is through the stimulation of the lacrimal functional unit to produce a healthy tear foam. So how is that possible? Okay, OCO1 is a preservative free nasal spray that binds the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor on the trigeminal nerve endings in the nasal mucosa in your nose. So, as seen in our preclinical and clinical trials, this novel pharmacological activation approach of OCO1 activates the whole trigeminal parasympathetic pathway that we just talked about to promote the lacrimal function unit to produce the natural tear foam and reestablish tear foam homeostasis. Got it. Makes sense. Just check in here for questions. If anyone's got any questions, please pop them in. So is OCO1 focused just on lacrimal function and aqueous? What about, you know, goblet cells, um, my bone glands? Tell me more about just uh, the where this is all happening. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking, Matt. Sure. After you administer OCO1 nasal spray, as I said, the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway is activated. That in turn stimulates the lacrimal functional unit. So when you stimulate the lacrimal functional unit, you are stimulating the lacrimal gland, the goblet cells, and the meibomian glands. With cholinergic stimulation of the lacrimal gland, we provide a graded release of proteins from the lacrimal unit, not just electrolytes. Also, in a paper presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology by Dr. Pedram Hamram, he reported a decrease in the area and perimeter of the goblet cells in humans after administration of OCO1. And this indicates a degranulation of the goblet cells and a release of mucin. So in this way, OCO1 is acting as a secretagogue. So OCO1 is designed to stimulate the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway and the lacrimal function unit to produce a normal healthy tear and restore tear foam homeostasis. Got it. Yeah, sounds uh, obviously it's clear that we both love to geek out on the science here, um, but it's yeah. <laughs> very, very promising and exciting. I, I, I can see why this is your favorite part. It's really exciting. Yeah. I mean, I think that OCO1 will be able to treat both the mild, moderate, and severe dry eye patients mm -hmm. um, once it's approved mm -hmm. for use by the FDA. And by having both a novel route of administration, um, it can benefit our patients with dexterity issues, patients who don't want to put in eye drops, and I think for many dry eye patients, the ocular surface is so irritated that this alternative route of administration 
and mechanism of action will provide an alternative approach that's really useful to treat our dry eye patients. Yeah, no, it's very, very exciting for certain. Um, for those of you out there, definitely check out Oyster Points booth. I've got it right here. You've got to go to it yourself, but they have an incredible, really good video here on the impact of tear film in dry eye. Do check that out. Um, also, you could check into their booth to receive more information, chat with their team and more. So, um, Dr. Maxi, any other closing thoughts you want to add or things you're uh, kind of excited about for the future? Well, as I said, Oyster Point is devoted to first-in-class therapeutics for the ocular surface. So we are um, very excited about OCO1. Though it is not yet FDA approved, um, I think we've got some super exciting things in our pipeline, and I can't wait till next year when we can meet again and discuss those. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm looking forward to working more with you guys. I think there's some really, really promising things to come. I'll definitely keep my, my thumb on the pulse, my ear to the ground for sure. Um, but everyone watching, do check out some of the upcoming educational sessions. We've got some just amazing things that will have you stronger than ever on your dry eye skill set when you head back to clinic on Monday. Um, and for those of us watching also, do check out the conference bag. I want everyone to specifically, we're donating a dollar to Optometry Giving Site for everyone that clicks the button on our on your behalf, we'll donate it. So we're getting there. We've got only $350 so far, but we've got like 2,000, 3,000 oh. people that showed up. So you gotta get into that conference bag and donate a, a dollar or we're gonna have to move the button somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, get in there and donate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, absolutely, everyone. I hope you have a great time, Dr. Max. I pleasure having you. I wish Oyster Point all the best. I'm sure you guys are gonna have an amazing, amazing upcoming next couple of months. Really look forward to hearing more. And um, thank you for joining us and for supporting the Eyes on Dry event. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Have okay. a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.